Hey everybody, welcome to the Unreal Engine live stream. I'm Alexander Pascal, and joining us today, Marcus and Michael. Hello. Yeah, Hello. We're here to talk about performance and all the new fancy stuff that's going to be coming out in the next couple builds, and I'm pretty excited to show it all off. But of course, first, it's the news. All right, Shelly. Nice. That was a great transition. <laughs> All right, so uh, first thing, it's up. You've probably noticed uh, out of nowhere, it's a 4103 hotfix with about 16, I think, uh, I can't remember the exact number, new, um, oh, it does say right there, 16 new issues that have been resolved. These are pretty important crashes and stuff. One of them affects VR, a few of them just fix uh, packaging stuff and other kind of general crashes. Uh, go pick it up, it's nice, makes things a little bit shinier and happier. That's all that there is to it. Next up. Uh, we've done yet another round of educational dev grants. Uh, some people have been awarded again. Uh, these, these are awarded to people that are going well out of their way to teach others and just help the community as a whole. Uh, you can find a full list of these on our blog uh, with exactly what they've been given and how it all adds up. It's pretty amazing and uh, check out all the links to these sites because you will learn a lot. Uh, it's good introductory tutorials to really in-depth stuff that you have to be pretty advanced already to get, but it's it's really it's really important to have. All right, next. So uh, we uh, concluded, uh, or locked down, I should say, uh, the submissions for One Hit Wonder. It's all, you know, we're all going through the judgment process now, pulling everything, getting it passed out. Next week will be the announcements and the raffle, again, I'm going to remind everyone, there is an Intel 750 series SSD and uh, the winners uh, for the raffle. And the winners of the Game Jam will all be receiving licenses to Houdini from Side Effects. So lots to win this time around. You want to tune in next week for all of the, the big prizes. It's going to be a big jam show, basically. Uh, it'll be pretty fun. Pretty fun. And... And just another reminder that we are sunsetting uh, some of the samples that have been around for quite a while that uh, aren't as uh, kind of cool and new as some of the other ones. We're going to be spending more uh, time and energy and effort making new samples, new content, and so this will allow us to kind of free up space and free up time for our developers to do that. However, as kind of an awesome little bonus, if you go over onto the wiki, you'll see the example project uh, page, and here you can find project pages for them where you can still download them, where you can see all the info that was always there, but you can also edit them. So if you want to add in your own notes, your own like updates, go for it. It's, it's all there for you. It's, it's a lot of fun. So that's what I have for the news today. What? <laughs> I got clicked. Oops, I'll bring that up. And here we go. So, uh, Shelly, why don't you play the clip for this first one and I'll talk over it. So, first up here, One Hit Wonder, which, as you all know, hasn't been judged yet, uh, actually had one of its entries by CD called One Hit Wonder, uh, already put out on Android, and you can download it already. Um, I guess I was just so amazed that it went from Game Jam uh, start to Android game fully published and whatnot. You see, you get achievements and everything in there uh, in basically a week. Uh, it seems like there was 10 hits, not one <laughs> Bam, 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 bam. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and uh, really fun, cool music. Uh, I love the animations. <laughs> the, the whole crowd does like one animation thing in that kind of stadium crowd from the 1990s game style. Uh, but it's very fun and exciting. And I'm going to throw this out here. If you go onto the forums, you can see, right, right, you see these little links, and, and you know, sometimes people put links at the bottom, like, come buy my stuff. Third link, 250 free codes for this game. So if you want it for free, you can just go right onto the forums, and you click this, and it'll open up a big spreadsheet, and it's going to have just tons of free, cool codes. And uh, again, it's already on Android Store, so go check that one out. No, I'm not saying that this is a winner, by the way. I, 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 we haven't even gotten around to judging everything. But the fact that it was already published just amazed me, so I thought you will all get a kick out of that. Cool. Next up, we have an ArcViz piece. 
Um, now, the, the creator of this has, uh, has a character in their name, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I, I'm going to say uh, Clopodlo, but that's not an L. But uh, Clopodlo has made a Zuma house, and it's uh, an absolutely gorgeous architectural visualization project where you get a fly through in this brutalist, I, I mean, maybe I'm not an architecture major, so I can't really 100% say, but I'm going to say brutalist architecture style. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I'm, also uh, not an archaeology <laughs> major. Ar archaeology major. Ar I'm not, not that either. I'm not an archaeology I mean, major, right? Architecture. Is, yeah. yeah, but I mean, it, it's it's that hard edges, very um, concrete. Sort of concrete and everything. Yeah, the concrete. And, and then it has this nice organic vine structure over it where the vines look very realistic and they're using something to create kind of a volumetric vine system. Very, you know, classic archivism in those senses. Um, lots of pictures of chairs. I always notice that's the thing in, in Arkfas. They love their chairs. There's always at least 50 of them. And just gorgeous style. It actually looks like a Quentin Tarantino movie scene to me. Like someone's yeah. about to just break out and get hit in the face. Yeah. And then... <laughs> you get the, the one chair. lonely chair. <laughs> that one said, this is the tie-out chair. You get in trouble, <laughs> he puts you in the little little box chair. But uh, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, again, I'm sorry I, I can't pronounce your name because I'm unfamiliar with one of the characters in it. But um, uh, very, uh, very nice overall project. All right, next, this one is a wiki entry uh, by, actually it's over here. Uh, okay, so this is uh, a wiki entry for an easy way of translating your game. And it's actually just a straight-up tutorial for the lo localization dashboard, but I've noticed that some of them aren't like, always that amazing. This one is very amazing. It's just, here's what you needed to know that you didn't know that you needed to know for localization in a simple, you know, fast, and as I to say, straightforward way. Uh, you can come in, very cool, lots of text. I'm not going to go through all the text. You guys know what a tutorial looks like, but here's a nice little gif to show you what it is. So you see in English, and then you can swap it out, and done. So give that one a shot. Pretty, uh, pretty good, especially if you're going to be sending you know, your game worldwide, and you know, everyone kind of does that these days, I hear. Nice. All right. Cool. Yeah, that's, uh, oh, you know what? I have this thing that I do, and sometimes I just space, because I'm not always there, but uh, I should go to the answer hub and pick out our top karma earners because that's very cool. All right, so we have to do this. See, the, the reason I don't have it open is because I have to refresh it on the spot because I have been shown that sometimes I'll have it open at the beginning of the stream and someone will come in, get a bunch of karma at the last minute, <laughs> and then I get thrown off. So sometimes I forget to have this up here. Okay. Top Karma Earners of the Week, Jackie, uh, Shadow River, and uh, this one's new to me, ID10T. I, oh, Identity? Is that, what do you guys, is that what it is? ID10T? So, ID10T. Uh, very cool. You're, you're one of the new ones, Jackie and Shadow River. You guys are some old pros at this. So, very nice. Excellent work. And anyone else who wants one of these badges on the forums for Answer Hub Sage, you gotta get to work. These guys are getting <laughs> they're getting pretty hardcore and competitive up here, and they're getting several hundred karma a week. So excellent job. Sure. Speaking of excellent jobs, you guys have been doing an excellent job making the overall experience better, I hear. We've been doing our best. <laughs> cool, yeah. cool. Um, so yeah, let's let's just Dive right in, and, and wherever you guys want to get started, I'll give you guys this. Yeah, you 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 have the power. Show show me what you got. <laughs> so yeah, uh, four point eleven is, I think, one of the biggest releases we've ever had. Um, maybe even bigger than four point seven. I don't know. It's, it's got quite. Yeah, a, it's pretty big. It's it's pretty big. It's got a lot of stuff in it, and. Uh, there should be quite a few changes where you don't have to do anything. Like you just mm -hmm. merge to 4.11 and hopefully get a nice performance boost in a lot of ways. I think uh, Michael is going to talk about some of the <laughs> gameplay type stuff. and then uh, Thanks for the spotlight, Shelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
but that is a, that is a really good thing to hear that in that uh, these most of these enhancements you're not even gonna have to go in and check a checkbox or make it just, but there there are gonna be there's some a of those significant bugs. number of stuff that just happens for you yeah. and then we've also got a lot of things that allow you to scale content down from low to high end machines mm. um, we'll talk about some of that um, in addition to like a few other other little features we'll get soon. Yeah, I mean, there's there's been improvements all across the engine uh, from rendering uh, both CPU and GPU side on the rendering side and uh, CPU side on the game thread as well. Um, both things that just you know automatically happen. So things like uh, animation just gets faster. You know, the clock gets a lot faster. Then there's some things that you can opt into as well, where we've made them fast for a limited set of things, or like we made them fast, but only when you know other certain things are true. Uh, you know, where we'll continue hardening them in future releases, but you kind of have to opt in to the fastness if you know that it's going to be safe as well. That's probably the best way of saying it. Yeah, stuff like, you know, you can opt in to asynchronous ticks on some of your objects, right? Mm -hmm. If you know that it's yep. road safe to do. Mm -hmm. okay. So like particle systems are one of the examples where uh, almost all particle system modules can now uh, run on another thread while other game thread stuff is going on. Um, I think the collision module and a couple other modules are sort of blacklisted, so those will end up forcing the entire uh, park system to run on the main thread. Um, but that's not on by default yet. I mean, that will probably be on by default in a future build, but right now you have to set a C bar to enable the parallel particles. Yeah, I believe some of that happens automatically in 4.11, but the, the bulk of it's going to happen in 4.12. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there were a few bugs in a couple of the modules as well that got fixed in 4.12. Yes, there were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. drag it onto the right screen so they can see it. Yep. And there you go. And so uh, some of the things we want to talk about are the just sort of systems that have already been in place in the engine that are either the same but uh, help you dig into performance or are actually better, like we've made them easier to use, fix bugs in them, stuff like that. So um, we're going to talk about like just a few of the top level first steps you might use to dig into performance in the game. So I'm just going to go to Pi here. So uh, one of the things that we have sort of pervasively across the engine is called the stat system. And so it instruments the game and uh, the engine code and everything. Uh, lets you say, how long did this take? How long, how many times did it get called in the frame? How much memory is this thing using? Uh, things along those lines. So uh, the your typical gateway to it is just to use the console. So you can do things like, um, there's both high level and low level things. So like stat unit is probably one of the first go-tos in trying to figure out where you're bound. So whenever you do stat unit, you see this up in the corner, you've got the frame time, the game time, the draw time, and then on some platforms you have the GPU time as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the GPU time is typically an estimate, like it's, it's inferred indirectly as opposed to directly on a platform like PC, but it's still quite useful. And so you can see here, uh, it looks like draw thread is absolutely not bound, but you see the game and the GPU are both about the same. In this case, it's probably not uh, game thread bound because there's just nothing going on in the scene. But what ap actually happens is the game thread is basically being locked to the GPU, so it's running at the same thread, same speed. So usually, um, you know you're bound when you have one particular outlier. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And one one key thing to understand about these stats is. Um time that the thread spends sleeping is actually subtracted from the stat mm -hmm. unit. So if you would take, if you had something like Intel VTune or something, you might you might see the thread is actually longer than, than this thing reports because it might be asleep waiting for some other job to wake it up or just mm -hmm. for something to do with its level. Yep. Uh, and that's, that's kind of why the frame time can be longer than the other two bars. Like you might look at all your bars and go, okay, well I'm under 16 milliseconds on all of these, my frame time is still too high. Mm -hmm. But just based on the the way the threading pipelines, you know, something might be idle for longer and then come over and then like the total time ends up too high. But, yeah. yeah. And so you can also notice uh, if you're, for example, render thread bound, you may end up starving the GPU where it's actually idle for a big part of the frame and then it ends up having to do all of its work towards the end of the frame. And so even if each individual time doesn't seem that large, your total frame time could be quite large because you weren't keeping the GPU well fed. But um, that's, a, you know, that's sort of a little further down the line when you're pretty close to your budgets. Um, once you've kind of figured out where you're bound, like you're, are you GPU bound or are you CPU bound, what you'd use 
um, to dig into each one of those dippers. So for example, um, one of the most common things is if you're bound by either draw calls or by actual GPU time is something like a stat scene rendering. And so you probably won't be able to read this on the stream, but uh, this gives you a sort of high level things in terms of... Uh, Shelly, can you enhance? <laughs> no, my joystick is broken. Oh, Shelly just broke her joystick. <laughs> enhance quadrant four. Oh, it just broke itself, got it. <laughs> I thought this was a CSI operation. <laughs> yep. uh, don't worry about it. I mean, mostly this, you know, like the specifics of the scene don't really matter. It's more this is one of the things you would use in your own scene when you're trying to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, going to show you static number of static meshes drawn, number of draw calls. Another, another nice one is stat RHI. RHI. Yeah. Stat RHI is a good one as well. And so you can actually have multiple stat things uh, on screen at once. It'll just stack vertically. But when you have something big like stat scene rendering on screen, you're probably not going to be able to see anything else. So I just typed it again to turn it off. Especially when you're in Pi where you don't have that much vertical yeah. resolution. Yeah. Actually, I can go ahead and throw this into Mercy Mode. Hey, Nick, Nick Darnell's in the chat telling you guys to grab the magnifier tool. <laughs> <laughs> Nick. Windows magnifier? All right. Uh, hang on. Hang on. Whoa. I might have this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, look. There, she, got, she got it. Nice. Oh, yeah, you can see that a bit better now. Without my joystick. Yep. Doing it manually. So you get triangles drawn. You get uh, yeah. Yeah. primitive yeah. counts, stuff like that. And this can be really useful to identify just sort of like something's terribly wrong. Like you're, you're off by orders of magnitude or something like that. Um, you know, if you see just crazy high numbers of triangles, uh, one of the things you can try and do is figure out like what in the scene is causing it. So like one quick simple thing to do is using the show flags. So you can do like show static mesh. Static meshes. And you can see how that changed the triangle count. So in this case, you know, it basically had no impact on the triangle count at all. Well, I mean, it changed it by a couple thousand, but like the static meshes in the scene are not where the triangles are coming from. Whereas if I do show skeletal mesh, we can see that, you know, that dropped the triangle count by, you know, 130,000 or something like that. Um, you notice that you still see a shadow, and that's why it didn't drop it more, because the triangles are split up between sort of that initial pass and the shadow pass. Mm. So if I do show shadows... Show dynamic shadows. Oh, show dynamic shadows. So now we're down to like 7,000 triangles, which is probably the BSP in the scene. Uh, the uh, BSP, is, but also box, the stats themselves are a non-trivial portion of that because uh, the stats are sort of like a part of the engine. So just rendering this on-screen display of the stats is actually using triangles to draw all that text and stuff as well. Yeah. Another useful thing if you print that back on, is um, the profile GPU command yep. when you're in the, when the editor. Show up a nice graph of the, the draw calls that are going to the GPU. Mm -hmm. So you can, handy. you can dig into this as well. Yeah, and down at the bottom, down at the bottom there, there's a... Uh, the duration. The, the chart with the durations, it's, it's hierarchical and you can, you can dig into there. And one other thing to note when you're on a PC, uh, if you see an abnormal amount of time spent in one particular place, that may not be real. Like sometimes there can be random driver hitches or something else on the OS that's kicking in um, and ends up making a step take an abnormal amount of time. So if you see something that just you can't explain, run it, run it a couple more times, and you know that bubble may move around or you know not be in the additional. Passes. Exactly. Like if you if you go down to the post processing step and you see a 64 by 64 pixel down sample and it's at 15 milliseconds, it probably wasn't the down sample. It was probably the driver yeah. having a little hitch. So the other thing that's kind of handy here is if you do, I think, show material draw events is hopefully enabled on this guy. We recently improved this. So you might have to do profile GPU to bring it up again. Yeah. But when you expand the, um, when you expand scene and then go into the base pass, you'll now actually get uh, the name of the material around each draw call. Word support is not so you should. Uh, yeah, so I see ramp material. Whereas before, without the show material draw events, you would just have mm -hmm. just a list of time for the entire pass. And this can really help you dig into specifically which object, like maybe you have one particular object yeah. that re has a really expensive shader on it. You yeah. find it that way. So one other thing that's like just a great go-to are the different visualization modes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in the editor, you can drop, get to these from the menu, but when you're in Pi or in uh, Uncooked Game, you can actually just use the F keys. So for example, F5 here is the shader visualization. Oh, 
uh, shader complexity, basically. This, is, this conflates right there on his chest. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this conflates two different things. It's both sort of the depth complexity. If you have translucency, you got a bunch of layers on top of each other. But then also the per pixel cost of the material. So like you could have a really cheap translucent material mm -hmm. that's just stacked really deep like graphs. Or you could have a really expensive opaque material that's only one layer, but it costs a lot. So in this case, I think he's got like the decal overlaying his Unreal logo on his chest. Oh, on his chest, and that's what kind of gives him that shape that looks like yeah. Finn from Adventure yeah. Time on his chest. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, okay. yeah, the cost is additive here. So, it, and so you can sense. see this scene doesn't have a lot going on in it, so it's not all that complicated. A couple other quick things. Uh, so that's F5. You can turn that on. Using F5, you can go back to regular rendering with F3. Yeah. Uh, F1 is wireframe, which is really helpful for seeing, like, do you have crazy density? Like, are there boots, are there toes inside of somebody's boots or things like that? Or is there, like, a thousand triangle eyeball inside yeah. of an eye socket? If, if your wireframe looks solid, you probably need to add some LEDs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then F2 is unlit, which can help, like, if you've got really expensive lighting, like a bunch of uh, dynamic shadows, mm -hmm. they're adding a lot of cost. That can be really helpful. F3 is the regular rendering. I don't remember if F4 actually does anything. I don't remember. Give it a shot. Find out. I've pushed it already. I usually right. go, I usually go there. through the, the, the buttons in the menu. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so I'm, let me go ahead and get back out of Pi here and just show a couple of those other visualizations. So. Yeah. And we've got more of these coming soon, I think. Yeah. I, don't know if I think in 4.12, the menu, there's actually a sub menu that specifically puts all the uh, the, the performance visualizations and sub menu. Yeah. So. Quad oh, complexity. It's Tron. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of like wireframe in that it, it's giving you a sense of how dense your mesh, meshes are. Mm -hmm. Except this way it's kind of an additive color coded thing, so you don't really have to guess wow. like in the wireframe. I just yeah. kind of want this as a shader, honestly. It's really neat. <laughs> but yeah, modern GPUs uh, always process everything in sort of like two by two quads, uh, so they can compute the texture derivatives. And so this, you know, lets you sort of see the edges of all of your triangles, yeah. effectively. So if your triangles are about the size of one pixel on the screen, you need some LEDs. Yeah, because your the GPU is not doing work very efficiently at that point. You, you know, it's only drawing one in four. It's doing four times the work that it needs to be doing. <clears throat> and I believe that one, that mode is new to four. Um, one other useful mode in here that's less performance, but it's really great for trying to debug like why something doesn't look right, is the buffer visualization overview. Whoa. Oh, I see. It just splits up in a ton of it's, menus. Yeah. It's basically, you know, we use a deferred renderer, so we, we're generating all these different buffers uh -huh. and then using them to create the final result. And so this lets you see, you know, sort of what's in each one of those individual buffers. Very nice. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, just to clarify, I forgot to kind of mention earlier off that this is uh, 411 Preview 5 that we're in. So mm -hmm. this is this is stuff you can go grab right now yeah, and come yeah. mess yep. around with it with us. So Yeah, and some of the things we're talking about didn't make it in 411, they'll yeah. be in 412. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, we're always committed to continuing to improve performance That's and optimization yeah. forever. Yeah. So. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, these, these are just in particular what we're showing at this moment. Yeah, yeah. but they, they do have some other stuff they're going to talk about. It's going to be further in down the line mm -hmm. and not coming in 411. So let's go ahead and flip back to regular rendering and talk a little bit like that was you know a lot more GPU focused. So uh, CPU wise, uh, actually I need to go back into Pi because the game thread is not really doing anything. And so we'll go and turn off stat RHI. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You can also do stat none if you forgot which ones you brought yeah, up. Just to sort of and get back to the just clear everything. Um, so stat game is sort of your first go-to on the game thread. That's just sort of a high-level overview of the game uh, game thread. But you can go into a lot more depth. Like there are literally thousands of stats in the engine across the game in the render thread. Um, so this lets you see like you know where your time's being broken down into like tick time, um, net tick, uh, so on and so forth. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of super in-depth stuff. So, like, you know, if you want to dig into, you know, what specifically is ticking, things like that, uh, there's individual stats for those. There's stats for animation. There's stats for physics, you know, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of this, you know, just look at the help. And also, you know, if you type stat and, you know, start typing, you'll get autocomplete for a lot of categories as well. Uh, if you're feeling really ambitious and you want to see everything, you can do a, like a stat dump frame, yep. and that will. So I'll show what that looks like. 
Is that just got to the wall, right? It goes out to the wall, yeah. yeah. The mouse cursor go. It's got it. Oh, there it is. So, window, developer options, developer tools, uh, you can get to the output log. And this is sort of like a more low level log than the message log. And it's got a lot of startup spew and stuff like that. So, it's, it's usually something you're only going to look at if you know what you're looking for, if you added custom logging yourself. But, for example, here's like sort of the, the stack call stack of that frame. And so, so a lot of those are task threads that are doing some parallel work. And yeah, typically you're, you're going to focus on the game thread and maybe yeah. the render thread, depending on what you're working on. Um, one other thing to note is that the stat system itself does actually have some non-trivial amount of overhead. So while you've got one of these stat captures up, your frame rate's going to go down a little bit. Um, but everything is usually proportionally correct. So if something's taking up 20% of your time in stats, it's probably close to 20% of your time in you know, your real game as well. The one exception is if you see like a really crazy high count, because um, the, the cost is proportional to the number of times that stat was hit. So if you see a stat with like a call count of 10,000, you may be drowning in sort of just the overhead of the stat itself as opposed to the cost of the code it's running. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, another thing about stats and asserts and things like that, uh, and to some degree logging as well, is that they're all enabled in a default development build. But there's also two other configurations called test and shipping, where we compile out some portion or all of that. Um, so usually you'll actually ship a shipping build of your game where you don't have the overhead even when not enabled for these different systems. Um, test is basically the shipping build plus like debugging console and a couple of debugging commands. So it's frequently what you use for higher level profiling, like where you don't need to dig down into why it's slow. You just want to know how fast is my game right now. Yeah, and test, you pretty much just get the uh, stat unit in the, the yep. do you get the graph? Uh, stat unit, stat unit graph, uh, yeah, stat graph. FPS, and stat raw will work, right. but none of the granular stats, like okay. just the high level per frame stats will yeah. work. So if you go into test and do stat RHI, you're not going to see anything because we're, yeah. we're not tracking at the same time. Yep. Um, one other really useful one, uh, it's not going to be particularly useful in here because there's, again, nothing going on in the scene, is uh, stat space dump hitches. And so what that does is it starts running, then whenever you hit a hitch, um, it prints out the stat call stack for that frame. So it's really useful to try and dig in, like, you know, you're playing your game and like every so often you see a periodic hitch, like, you know, what is that? Is it garbage collection? Is it some game code? Like, did I spawn an actor somewhere else in the world that didn't spawn 10,000 other actors? You know, and it's just amazingly useful to try and drill into why is my game hitchy? Huh. That's um, what again? Stat space dump hitches. It's all one word. Okay. Yeah. Um, cool. One other thing that we added in 4.11 is sort of uh, performance targets. So, you know, traditionally, the, you know, Unreal has been used to make a lot of different games, but a lot of these performance things, you know, we built sort of in the heat of the moment for a particular game. And so, like, a lot of thresholds and color coding and stuff like that were all built in for sort of targeting a game like Gears, where it was hitting 30 FPS. So the color coding on like the game thread and draw time and all that would be based on did you hit a 33 millisecond frame? And it was just hard coded in there. Same thing for like what is the definition of a hitch? Mm -hmm. um, in 4.11 we've changed all of that mm -hmm. where there's now C bars that control all these things. So if you want to target a 60 hertz game, you want to target 95 hertz for VR, mm -hmm. or you want to do like, you know, UT and do 120 hertz, you know, super fast, uh, awesome action, you have control over all those now. So. So it's, uh, for example, it's like t dot hitch. You can find all these in uh, base engine dot ini, but some of them are like t hitch dead time window, t hitch frame time threshold, and t hitch versus non hitch uh, ratio. These are all used for something like stat dump hitches, as well as the FPS chart, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and they let you define like what do I consider a hitch in my game. So if you're targeting a thirty hertz game. You might use a definition of a hitch is about uh, 60 milliseconds instead of 33 milliseconds. And then the other two are kind of filtering mechanisms. So the 1.5x says, is the, like, the hitch versus non-hitch ratio is defaults to 1.5. And so what that means is, if I'm running slow, like because you know I've got a lot of graphical effects or something, and so I'm running slow for quite a while, so like my frame rate has dropped down to 20 FPS or whatever, I don't want to consider that a hitch because it's not like you know, it's changed the impact 
it doesn't feel bad or it doesn't feel worse, I guess is a better way of saying it. And so we don't want to like just constantly be saying, I'm hitching, I'm hitching, I'm hitching. And so that filters that out. And in the same way, the hitch versus uh, the, the dead time window says, if I hitched, I don't want to consider another sort of hitch within a certain number of milliseconds as a real hitch. Because frequently what will happen is, you know, on PC, if somebody's doing something in another process, it's going to cause a spike of time that lasts for more than a single frame. And so just ignore that period of time uh, between hitches. Sorry, that's, it's, it's a little bit of dense information, but I might try and make a little picture to uh, go off of the form. <laughs> Compress all but, that super knowledge into one happy little picture. <laughs> um, but yeah, these plus um, like target frame times and stuff mm -hmm. are you know really useful if you are targeting something other than a 30 hertz game. So if you're targeting 60 or 95 or whatever, you can set those and they'll affect stuff like stat unit up here. Mm. It's like whether this is green, yellow, or red are all controlled by C bars now. Oh, so that's that could be very useful for just anything, honestly, VR to mobile. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as you have some kind of scalability, you have to think about. Yeah, yeah. And you can also set them at runtime too. So, for example, if you have a game where multiplayer is at one speed and single player is at a different speed, you know, sometimes games will do yeah. thirty hertz campaign with a sixty hertz multiplayer. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hadn't really considered that. I was just thinking, well, maybe if your boss comes bursting in the room, say, "Can I change it right now?" <laughs> and that's what you need at runtime. Yeah. That's exciting. And those are all, they're effectively cosmetic. Like, they don't affect how anything in your shipping game works. They're just for, you know... Uh, yeah, it's just about filtering your data. Yeah. So you get the mm -hmm. useful information that you need to, yeah. to optimize the game. Yeah, I mean, because that's one of the big things about a lot of these different tools is there is just a, literally a torrent of data here. So how do you filter it and get actionable information? Like, how do I actually fix something based on what I've found here? Um, there's another thing I'm not going to show here, um, but it's covered in the documents, is uh, you can basically do stats based start file, and that starts recording all of the stats into a, a .u read for stats file, and then stats based start, stop stat, stop file, which finalizes the file and writes out you know, the end of the file and stuff. And then you can open those up from in the editor. You can do editor, or window, Developer Tools Session Front End. And then in here, you can go over to Profiler and do Load. And you can actually also use this to attach directly to uh, another process running on the uh, same machine if you're running with cache messaging. Um, but frequently, you'll end up saving off the file so you can open it up later, you know, and compare them over to across time and stuff like that. But this lets you uh, sort of interactively dig through the profile and figure out you know, what's going on here. And the other nice thing about it is you can just leave it running so you don't have to be looking at the screen constantly while you're running. So you can run through a level or run through a, a multiplayer match, and then pull this back up afterwards and look for spikes, look for, you know, prolonged slowness, and look for sort of your biggest bang for buck wins. Where, like, if I fix this one thing, you know, it was in 20% of the frames, and so, you know, my overall average frame rate's going to go up quite a bit. Um, oh yeah, so one other thing I'll talk about real quick before we go over to some of the improvements that we've done for 411 and 412 is FPS charts. So you can start an FPS chart by doing start FPS chart, all one word, and that's just going to start recording data. So I can run around in here, you know, play, you know, do, you know, ideally you want to get quite a bit of data so that you're not having transient events swap it, like so the average basically uh, gives you useful information. But I'm gonna go ahead and stop it here real quick. So it's a stop FPS chart to stop it. And on Windows, this will just automatically open up the folder where it wrote it to, mm -hmm. but it's always gonna be in saved profiling FPS chart stats. So you can use this on consoles and mobile as well. And so this writes it out the data in like a couple different formats. Um, the the text document, the CSV and the HTML, or the text document and the HTML are both sort of the high level summaries, and then the CSV actually has the raw frame to frame to frame unit times. So typically you won't end up using this, but this can be useful to sort of visualize it over time. Most of the time you're just going to look at the aggregates. Ooh, 
black and gray is not Whoa. very readable. That's not... That's this was made for dark theme. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, can I select it? Yeah, that helps them. Um, so you can... It writes out a lot of useful information, especially if you're going to get this from multiple machines um, or you know from playtest users or stuff like that. So it writes out the CPU and GPU and OS, stuff like that. Um, then these here are all the scalability settings. So the engine has like built-in scalability buckets so you can say, you know, I want post-processing to be at level 3 or at level 1 or 2 or 0. Same thing for shadows and particle systems and stuff like that. Yeah. And what, what specifically is... Enabled at those various buckets is configurable for your own game. Yeah, like we, we set some reasonable defaults in the engine, and this is the same thing that like the editor scalability options do. But in your default uh, scalability.ini in your project, you can actually redefine any or all of the buckets to say, you know, I want to set these additional properties that are custom to my game, or you know, I want to skew more towards higher end, or I want to skew more towards lower end PCs, things like that. Um, so some of the other things here, we've got like the percent over 30, percent over 60, percent over 20, 120. Um, one thing to note about these is that they're only really valuable if you are not vsync locked. Because when you're vsync locked, you know, ideally the percent over is zero because you're locked exactly. Although in practice what you'll actually see is that the max you could hit is about 50 as opposed to 100%. Um, then the last two sections are like the individual buckets where we've sort of binned the frame times. So this is the frame time balance you can see here. Like basically there are nothing below 60 hertz and then everything is in between the 60 to, you know, over 120 hertz buckets. And, the, and then the amount of hitches and then the hitch histograms as well. So this can be useful to see, you know, how badly am I hitching and, you know, is it... Am I hitching by like dropped frames or am I hitching by like hundreds of milliseconds because something bad is happening in my game code or engine code? Um, we're going to be doing a little bit of an overhaul here, probably for 412, maybe for 413, where we're going to uh, present a couple of different top level metrics that make it easier to work with. Because right now, like what we frequently do is we take these and then we compute additional stuff to generate a report for sort of the overall health of the game. But, you know, why do that additional step of computing it when we can just compute it right when we capture these? And so we'll have things like hitches per minute, um, probably a percent of frames dropped, and a couple of other metrics like that. So, yeah, that, that's a pretty high-level overview of sort of how you might dig into performance. Um, one other thing to note is you can actually add your own stats to your game as well. Like... Um, there's quick underscore scope underscore cycle counter, which lets you just say, you know, you just put this in a scope inside of a function in C++, and then it'll automatically capture that, and it'll go into the quick category. And then you can also define custom categories and add stats to those categories. So you can do, like, stats based, you know, Paragon game, and then you get stats that we've done, or Paragon UI that are stats specifically to the UI system, you know, so on and so forth. Ooh, cool. Wow. Yeah. Cool. So what is... Want to switch over to sort of some of the new features coming? Yeah, let's talk yeah, about let's, let's let's switch about over the features. That. Actually, actually, chat's been sitting around like, but these aren't new, new. No, <laughs> it, no, it's no, just no. trying to do a, a high-level overview or introduction to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so now on to the new, new. Okay, guys. Sometimes I have to tell them, just give it a second. We've got a lot to cover today. <laughs> give it a second. Give it hmm. twenty minutes. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's all the same. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you want to talk about some of the rendering stuff first? Yeah. Sure, let's scroll, talk about some rendering stuff first. On scroll on down to my section there. So, uh, like I said, this is a pretty big release, and 412 is going to be a big release also. We've got a few things in the pipe that are really going to help uh, scale game performance down. So, for example, one thing we've got in the pipeline that's going to be in 412 is something we call the Significance Manager, which is an experimental feature, and it's for dynamic scalability. So... Well, some aspects of that I think are actually in 4.11 as well. Like, some of the API is in, is in yeah. 4.11, but the, the... The implementation of the particle systems, for example, is yes. something in 4.12. But, but, we're, but we're not like declaring it experimental in, even until 4.12? Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay. yeah. yeah it, it's sort of very much a use-at-your-own-risk in 4.11. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it can be very useful. So it, it provides some, some hooks for your game to implement so that you can decide the uh, significance of various things. So, for example, on your, your particle effects... You might have 20 emitters in there, and you might have one giant fog sheet that's like 
the main part of the explosion and you've got little sparks coming off uh, here and there and yonder. And you might, you might say that the fog sheet is critical significance because that has to be there or the effect just doesn't have any impact where all the other stuff might be of low significance. And then in your game, based on dynamic feedback of how things are performing, you can decide, okay, we're going to go and set all the particle emitters within 20 meters or all the particle emitters from other characters or all the particle emitters, uh, like you get to decide distance, your character, other, yeah. whatever you decide to do. And then when you set the significance on those emitters, then things drop out. So if you would say this particle component is low priority because it's some some other little minion's effect or whatever. Or it's like a footstep effect or, you or know, dust like a, cloud or something like exactly. that. It, just, it, it doesn't have gameplay significance. It's mm -hmm. just a visual nicety. Right. So you set that thing to low, and then everything that's not critical, marked as critical in that emitter, will just go away. Um, and there's a couple of modes they can go away, like they can immediately be killed, or they can just simply stop spawning particles. And it's just a way for you to dynamically scale your game. And then once, once your gameplay situation is back under control, like the big firefight's over and you're, you're back to normal, then things can start turning back on again. Mm -hmm. It's just a way to keep the, keep a, the smooth frame rate. Yeah, I mean, so we actually have a number of different systems already in the engine, and then this is basically a new system layered on top of them. Um, most of the existing systems are, I know about myself, and I don't care about anybody else or what else is happening. So they're mostly distance-based. So you can say, like, a particle system should, uh, you know, get cold after a certain distance, or you can say a, a static mesh should get cold after a certain distance, or drop to a, a lower lot at each distance level. And that works great for sort of static scenes, but it doesn't work great for like a really dynamic game with you know periods of high action and periods of low action. Um, and the same thing is true for Skeletal Mesh Lot as well, where the default system in the engine is purely distance based. The problem is, you know, for example, in a game like Paragon, you've got ten heroes all duking it out. Um, you could have all ten of them all within like say twenty or thirty meters of each other, you know, during a fight at a core or something like that. With traditional LOD, we'd say, hey, we want all these guys to be at like LOD 0, 1, or 2, you know, because they're all really close and in your face. But if you want to have like a hard budget, that means you've blown your budget already. So we use the significance system to say, all right, you know, here's a function for computing significance of heroes. So, you know, you could use distance, you can use um, the field of view, so on and so forth. And as well as like, is this my team or the enemy team, that sort of stuff. And say, all right, I figured out what my priority order for the heroes is, and now I've got a budget to dole out. So you can say the minimum LOD on the first closest X heroes is zero, so they're allowed to be at max level. Then we will dole out LOD level one and LOD level two. Um, and so that allows you to enforce sort of a hard budget on what it looks like without having to be super aggressive on the LOD level. So that means it looks really great if there's just a few people near you, but then when everybody's near you, you still run in a performant manner. Oh. Wow. Sometimes performance is what you want, especially yeah. in a big firefight. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, you don't want to have slow down like when you're, you know, it's the critical moment where you're trying to actually stay alive. Yeah. Um, so some other stuff we've got going, I, I believe the uh, sub-UV cutout yeah. stuff was presented by Daniel Wright in mm -hmm. the previous one, but just to briefly say, like, sometimes you'll have a particle effect, and in the texture for the particle, say it's a fireball or something, you know, the texture is square, but the you know, the actual important part of the texture is just like a circle in the middle. And depending on how big that is for your particle, uh, you might have 10, 20, 30% of dead space in the texture. And on... Yeah, we don't have any of that. Yeah. Sorry, I was just trying to see if we had the starter content, but there's not any of these. Yeah, I don't think we have an example. Oh, but, yeah. yeah, I didn't get injected into that. But like, uh, you know... <laughs> that was a good transition. <laughs> on a modern GPU, you know, you're, you're paying for all those dead pixels, right? Like, you've got your square, your vertex, mm -hmm. uh, your vertex shader puts out the quad, and then... For all the all the dead pixels, it still has to launch pixel shaders for those to sample to find the alpha, mm -hmm. and then it has to discard and kill the shader, which is which is somewhat of a waste. Mm -hmm. So what you'd prefer to do is instead of making a, a quad, to actually create the shape of the thing based on your texture. And so it kind of shrink wraps around. Yeah, it so. shrink shrink wraps around, and then all the dead space gets cut out by yeah. a, by a geometry, and then you don't have to launch pixel shaders for that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that you might use in Paper 2D, where you can manually or automatically define a border around a sprite so that you're not drawing a bunch of alpha zero uh, useless stuff, basically. Yeah. 
exactly the same idea. So yep. I, I believe there's already a tutorial, not a tutorial, but at least Daniel demoed it on the. You, yeah. you make a new oh, asset, you, you click a texture, yeah, you look at one of the old streams, you can see yeah. how you use it. But that is that in 411, which is nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think it was uh, either Daniel or Brian, one of the two, on one of our rendering and Paragon streams, and you guys got to see like little cutout shapes and how it goes from like red yeah, everywhere to red right. just in this one little area. <laughs> And that's kind of the demo of it. That's uh, coming soon. It's really mm -hmm. cool. Uh, I actually have a question about the uh, the significance manager that came in here. Uh, sure, now, sure. how often do the queries take place on that, and um, is there an overhead to the rendering significance system? Uh, there, there is a, a small overhead. Uh, I believe in Paragon right now, it's about 0.2 milliseconds on PS4. Yeah, because it's, that's it's using been, Parallel 4 for the proxy. That's using Parallel 4 to do the computation. Yeah, uh, we're planning on continuing to optimize it. Um, it. It's really just a function of how many things you have being processed. Like do it when it was doing just the heroes, minions, and objectives, it was you know like 50 microseconds. So it, it's almost negligible overhead compared to what it's gaining. Yeah, yeah. so we're oh, still optimizing okay. it, and, and we're also discussing the possibility of. You know, it may not be that you need to compute the significance for every object, every frame, right? You can uh -huh. put them on like a rolling, and just have a have a budget for the thing. Uh, yeah. I don't oh, think that's okay. in there yet, but uh, so yeah. so it's definitely something you want when you have a much larger kind of game, but maybe on a smaller one, the trade off isn't really so great. Yeah, it, it would it scales better at a larger larger scale if you can just okay, you do these ten this frame, these ten this frame. But we can do quite a few in a, in a pretty reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. oh, very cool. Thank yeah, you. it's also it's a function of what your uh, what your scalability or uh, significance function is. That's true. You are writing them. Like we yeah. don't compute that. That's something the game has to implement. So mm -hmm. depending on how complex your computation is, that's going to affect uh, yeah. affect the speed as well. But for example, with the heroes, uh, it was just entirely memory bound. Like actually having to get what the current LOD was uh, to then set the current LOD that was actually dominating the cost there. So I just cached that locally. Um, when it computes it, and you've got a, like a 4x speed up there, because the significance function is not very expensive for the individual heroes and minions. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, so, some other fun stuff that you just get automatically will be in 412, so there were some parts of the, just the actual particle rendering the low-level system where it was creating vertex factories uh, mm -hmm. too often rather than caching them. Now they get cached, so you, you'll see draw thread go down if you have uh, quite a few particles in your scene in 412. Yeah, we also fixed some bugs with uh, spawn rate uh, not affecting certain kinds of modules. I think like ribbons mm -hmm. and stuff like that just completely ignored spawn rate settings and scalability. Yeah. Uh, one thing I do want to call out because this uh, uh, we're changing the default on particle systems. They can choose to use the occlusion system or not. So like if you have a particle system that's behind a wall, whether or not it's occluded and then becomes essentially free, right? Because we're not rendering anymore. So by default, in up to 4.11 even, uh, it's set to not use occlusion by default. So for 4.12, that's being changed to use occlusion by default um, for particle emitters with fixed bounds. Uh, so what you probably want to do for your content before then uh, for particle emitters is go set occlusion and set fixed bounds on your particle, right. particle emitters. Oh, that's actually a, another good point. We've added a bunch of properties to particle systems so that you can just show details mode in the editor. So again, unfortunately I don't have any particle systems in this project, but I should probably show engine content specifically there. Um, but in the view type in the corner of the content browser, you can say tiles, lister, columns. So in columns view, you can actually see a bunch of additional properties mm -hmm. based on the dominant type of asset in that folder. And so in this case, there's two blueprints, but you can always also just use filters to force it to say only show textures or only show um, uh, particle systems. So I'll, I'll show you an example with the textures. Um, you'll get the idea of the same kinds of things you can do with other stuff. So here you can see all the different properties. W with textures, you know, you're going to want to focus on things like format and whether or not it's got mint maps and stuff like that to catch textures that are inefficient or too huge. With particle systems, you can now see uh, things like whether or not they've got fixed bounds, whether or not they use specific kinds of expensive or different properties, so like whether or not they have GPU emitters, whether or not they use, I think, scene color, um, whether or not they're looping, which can actually uh, be a really important thing. We'll talk about that in a minute as well. So all these are now right here, um, and it, this replaces several different console commands that you used to have to use when you were trying to dig into particle systems. You used to have to use like um, things that sort of spit out into the log 
kind of a CSV kind of format that you can paste into Excel to go digging. So it's real easy to add these to custom assets as well. If you've got your own asset types, you can just uh, implement um, Git Asset Registry uh, tags, I think, on the U object, or you can just tag pro U properties with Asset Registry searchable, and it'll automatically be harvested for you. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, what other cool stuff do we got? So, parallel rendering. This is a this is a feature that's near to my heart uh, since I started out working on PS4, where we have some cores to fill up. But uh, a lot of work's been done there, and a lot of it is just automatic. Um, so, for example, uh, we're doing better at load balancing these days with parallel rendering. So, for example, when, we, when we're rendering the, the base pass, you know, you might have a thousand objects to render, and you want to split that up amongst your four or five task threads or however much you, you want to do. You want to make sure you evenly distribute the work so that you don't have uh, one task thread taking much longer than the other ones, and a lot of work's been done to get to get that load balancing right uh, as dynamic scenes change. So uh, that'll just come for free. I think some portion of that is in 4.11, and then uh, I think the rest of the work will end up in 4.12. Um, other nice things in 4.11 uh, for static for static environments, we have a we have what we call um, draw lists. So meshes of the same type of the same material shader can all get drawn together uh, without state changes uh, to be efficient. Um, those draw lists would actually diverge if you would do things like use vertex painting to do vertex color overrides on your scene, and a lot of people do that for to mark, to mark up various data or just to, to make things look unique. Yeah, and that would cause... Or moths or yeah. things like that. Yeah. And that would cause the draw list to diverge and make your rendering less efficient um, so for free, just automatically behind the scenes, uh, we merge vertex color overrides uh, back into the same draw list again, which which is a pretty nice perk boost uh, yeah. for some content. Not all content uses that. So. But if you had content that was breaking up the streams because of that, right. just faster now. And in 4.12, we do the same thing for uh -huh. spline meshes now that use the same spline mesh. Um, oh, cool. So, so splines are more, more performant now. They are if you reuse the same spline. Still, if you create a different spline for each object, then that will not merge them. Yeah, so if you have one spline that you know is a bind and that you stamped that spline multiple times, yeah. those can be merged. But if you oh. had a unique spline in each place, it wouldn't be mergeable. So that sounds like it would kind of work alongside what Ryan brought to this like, foliage tool, which is mostly mm -hmm. spline-based, and then you kind of bake it out in a way. Yeah, if you bake it out and reuse the yeah. same meshes yeah, over so and over you again, you roots multiple times. Yeah. But oh. if every root were unique, then it's not going to merge it. Well, no benefit. yeah, that's understandable then. Mm -hmm. All right, wow. That's yeah. a really cool tool. Um, oh, this next one's one of my favorite ones. So... Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if, you, if you're writing a material shader, and you have, let's say you have uh, three textures to, to sample, like you've got a normal map, a diffuse map, and a spec map or something. So you're looking at your material node, and you have some computation to go through to compute the UVs, and a lot of times you use the same UV on all the maps because they're all the same size, and they're all kind of from the same object, so they're all the same. And let's say you have a relatively complex computation for the UV. For example, uh, parallax occlusion mapping does a significant amount of ray marching and, and various work to figure out what UV to do. Then you would sample, you have that one node with the UV, and then pipe it to all the different textures. Uh, prior to 4.11, um, it would actually recompute the, the computation for each one of those samples, which is quite inefficient. So and sometimes the shader compiler could identify that and optimize it away, but it, it was never a guaranteed thing, so right. remove the uncertainty. So the uncertainty is gone, and it will always collapse these now. Uh, so I think it was something that like, saved like 150 instructions or something in the parallax occlusion mapping one. Yeah, it was a huge and one. It was a big win. And just across the board, uh, something like maybe five. It, it, it varied by shader to shader, I don't really know. But it, it was definitely sort of like a global win. Like That's, it was multiple percent gain across the entire frame time. Yeah, so just just getting 4.11 <laughs> and recompiling your uh, cool. your shaders, you should see you should see at least a small performance improvement and, and potentially big If wins. you were GPU bound, obviously. Yeah. If you were GPU bound, yes. Yeah. Um, vertex lighting mode, yes, this is a good one. So mm -hmm. this one might be more interesting to, to mobile developers or people that want to scale down to really low-end PC hardware. And consoles as well. Uh, and, and some consoles. Uh, so previously, we only had unlit and fully lit, like fully per pixel lit particles. 
uh, we now have the ability to do an in-between cost mode for vertex lighting, where we compute the lighting at each each of the corner, each of the at, corners, at and it gets interpolated sense. across yeah. them. I think if you do the cutout sprites, it's actually at each point. Yes, if you do the cutouts, if you do the cutout at, uh, at, the, at each point along the, the shape of the particle, whatever the shape is, mm -hmm. and then that gets interpolated across the pixel more cheaply than actually computing it. So that can be a big win for, for mobile or you know, scale down. Um, another new feature, single sample pre-shadows. So this is where you might have you know, tens of thousands of dynamic objects running around your screen that they're not individually particularly important to pick up high quality shadows as they go into shadow, but you do want them to kind of fit into the environment yeah, you, uh, you don't want them fully bright when they've walked under an archway or something Yeah, like no, that. especially not when they walk into, like, your, your, you have some nice static lighting that's computed nice static shadows on the ground, and you want the dynamic things to come across but not have to pay the cost for, like, a full shadow map. Yeah. Uh, so there's a checkbox now on, in the actor. Uh, I think it, it may not have made it to 411, but it will be at least in 412. But there's a, there will be a checkbox on the actor, so you can select single sample shadows, and it will use the um, it'll use the volumetric. Yeah, it's important. Oh, there you go. Nice, thank you. Uh, but you can check that, and it's going to pick up a single sample of, oh, of a brightness value. It. Oh, it's probably set to mobility static. That's fine. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, because it has to be able to move it in the shadow. Yeah. So, so the way that that kind of visualizes is that it makes the entire guy just kind of get dimmer. Yeah, he, and then, he gets a, one yeah. single darkening value for the whole for yeah. the whole character. I think it only works yeah, for I, I static lighting have some stacks, you, have, you have to bake the lighting out. Because it works based off of the... Um, I'll do this while you're talking. Yeah, the volumetric. The volumetric, the same, the same stuff that lights, uh, translucency and stuff, just the, the low frequency... Mm -hmm. um, Volumetric lighting samples. Yeah, you don't get those really nice hard edges. Out of them, yeah, you won't you won't get nice hard edges kind of or anything. Faded in light, but they darkness. but they will fade in as they cross those boundaries and, mm -hmm. and look like they fit into the scene. And it can be it can be a nice performance win for things where you don't necessarily need the high the super high quality. Of light. Again, something something more for like mobile developers or PC scalability. Yeah, so you can see it's you know, fully lit here. And then as I move it under, it gets darker, but it's getting uniformly darker. It's not actually getting a nice hard shadow yeah, cast Because you can, you can see where that hard shadow cast yeah. would be. And but so part that of saves this is lot. there's okay. no texture on this, and so the lighting is like the only thing you're seeing. Once you actually have texture on it, it actually can be pretty hard to notice. You know, like it looks good enough in a lot of cases, basically. Yeah. It's, it's a nice trick to, mm -hmm. to, to get some time down when you're, when you're under the gun. Yeah. Um, what else? Just kind of free improvements again. So, uh, on a lot of modern modern hardware, the amount of stuff that you push from the vertex shader to the pixel shader, mm -hmm. there's a little cache in between, and it can fill mm -hmm. up pretty quickly. So you want to you want to limit the amount of stuff that comes out of the vertex shader to the pixel shader. So one thing that we removed, uh, we used to output a world position and also the just like the built-in DirectX semantic for uh, B position. So now, rather than pushing both across, we just use the V position, and then we can compute the world position yeah, of the pixel shader. And that's that's almost that's a, a win almost across the board. It's a small yeah. one. It's not like you're going to see yeah big game, ten, tens of percents, but it's it's, it's <laughs> nice. It's nice in, in certain cases. Yeah, mm -hmm. these little wins add up. Like you know, each one may not be much on its own, but over the you know, course of months, it can add up quite a bit. Exactly. You do mm -hmm. you know, ten or twenty of these small gains, and you, yep. you get there. In the end. Um, yeah, optimization is always one of those things that some people think of kind of at the end of their at the end of their cycle, but really throughout the whole thing, you need to be thinking, how can I get the little gains now so that I don't have to worry about a big gain later on? Well, also, if you have a target, like mm -hmm. start with yeah. that. Like basically, if if you stay at sixty the entire time, it's a lot easier <laughs> than someone doesn't drop a, getting like, to get it to ninety later. on yeah. you or whatever. You well, also, it lets you catch regressions. Mm -hmm. so, like if you're testing, you know, regularly or even daily, it's like now you only have a couple of days worth of code and content to figure out, you know. How did this impact me? As opposed to, you know, oh hey, you know we're ten times off budget. Yeah. How on earth are we going to get? That? If you spend a year <laughs> at thirty FPS and you want to be at sixty, then you, yeah, you're in trouble. You've, before, you've you know, got a long road to hoe. So yeah, don't leave this to the end. Like you know, sort of get a, a process and methodology in place. Mm -hmm. Like you know, be measuring it. Like even during your prototype, you may not do anything with the information, but you can at least see how it's trending over time. Yeah. So what's it? 
Another good feature here, the, the stencil-based dither. So I don't know, you guys may have noticed uh, on LOD transitions, we have like a little fizzling, uh, the engine has a little fizzling effect. And it used to be that that was done in the pixel shader via alpha testing. But again, just like the particle cutouts, that means you're paying for launching those pixel shaders to compute the thing. And then you're basically saying, all right, we're going to launch the pixel shader, compute a little thing, and then discard uh, before we complete the shader. But what you'd rather do is just not launch the pixel shader at all in the first place if you know up front mm -hmm. that you don't want to draw anything there. Uh, and we can do that with stencil uh, if you have enough stuff happening in your early Z pass. So if you're using a full early Z pass, which you might want to use because you're using decals or for other reasons, another nice benefit is that you can start using stencil based dither. And that should come on automatically. I think in 4.12, it's, it might be available in 4.11 if you set up certain options, but it'll definitely be in 4.12. Yep. And that, we found that to be a, a pretty big win, a pretty big win yeah. on a lot of, a lot of content mm -hmm. when, you, when you've got the early Z pass available. Yep. It's also uh, the uh, temporal AA helps get rid of a lot of the checkerboard pattern as well. Yes, yes. Temporal AA very, helps a lot with the fizzling pattern. Mm -hmm. Without it, you know, in the same way, like reflections don't look that great. You know, the yeah. checkerboard is pretty obvious without it. Well, unless you're at really high resolution. Um, what else? Async compute interface. This is this is this is a fun one. So this wasn't. This is not immediately a performance win. Uh, Four Eleven has the first draft of the kind of the first experimental look of what we want our async compute uh, coding interface to look like. And in 4.11, there is an example of using it in the reflection environment. It doesn't actually run asynchronously across any of the other units, um, but it's an example of how to use the API. And then in 4.12, we've already implemented asynchronous SSAO that overlaps with uh, base pass rendering, which is quite nice, because uh, Martin Mentoring made me a nice version that doesn't require normal inputs. So we can, as long as we have the depth from the early Z pass, then you can overlap uh, the computation with the base pass for uh, quite cheap on, on some hardware. Which is quite nice. um, and we're looking to move more of the post processing to compute and the async compute as we go along. So we're pretty excited about that one. Yeah. And it, help, it definitely helps with like overlapping when you know you're not using all of the GPU at that point. So. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times you have content that just does not use the capacity of the GPU, like uh, like during the early Z pass, right? It's it's pretty much all vertex work. You're not really using all the, the pixel units, yep. and so it's just free GPU capacity, and you can you can fill it with something. Mm -hmm. Some useful case if you can use the GPU. Uh, separate translucency downsample is a new feature in 4.11. So. Uh, this, this is not a, a new idea, but it's a new feature to the engine. Um, so, for again, for a scalability thing or like for a dynamic scalability situation, you might find that your your effects or your translucency is too expensive, and you might want to render it quarter res um, for for performance. And then, uh, so that's, there's a new CVAR like uh, separate translucency downsample. You can set your percentage. I would recommend using 50% or some percent where the downsample you know, works on even boundaries. But, yeah. uh, you can use it in two ways. You can either, like, you know, in a low scalability bucket or on certain platforms, you can say, hey, it's just always 50%. Or you yes. can, you know, potentially use something like the scalability system in 4.12 and determine, I've got a lot of large translucent effects going on in this frame. I better turn it on for this frame or for the, the next frame. Like, you may have a hitch to that one frame when you first detect it. But then you turn it on for a period of time, and then when the situation's been resolved, you can turn it back off. Yep. yep. It, can, it can really help smooth things out. Yep. Um, high quality particle lights. This, this is like an anti-performance <laughs> feature. Don't use it unless you're <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so particle lights, yeah. normally when you spawn lights through particle effects, they, uh, they mm -hmm. go through a, a simpler lighting path. They're not, they're not real lights like other lights that you might drop into the scene or whatever. Uh, the high quality particle lights, there's a little checkbox on, on, light, emit, on uh, light emitters now where they can actually spawn real engine lights and go through the real path. And there's also even a checkbox to make them shadow casting point lights. But you're a terrible person mm -hmm. if you never use that. Yeah, I, <laughs> unless you're making like a Put high quality... That's actually the warning that comes up when, you, when you check the box. Just, it's just a disappointed Michael Nolan. He's like, if you use shadow casting point lights, period, you're already. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah not, not very yeah. performant. You, you can easily bring your computer to a crawl if you have something that's spawning thousands of shadow casting points, but it's, it is or kind tens. of fun to do. Or, or tens, <laughs> or dozens. Yeah. And let's see, one nice free thing. Uh, we have a clear coat material mm -hmm. uh, as part of our deferred shading. Uh, and in 4.11 now, we actually will compute if anything is actually using it in the frame or not, and then switch to deferred shaders. They just completely compile that path out, so it removes some branches from, from the reflection path and from the, from the deferred shades. Again, it's worth, it's worth a little bit, um, but it's one of those things that, that tends to add up over time. And you just get that for free, you don't have to do anything. As long as you're not using clear code, you know, if you not have to pay for it. Uh, so switching back to the CPU side, there's a lot of uh, sort of just automatic systematic wins um, uh, for the game thread and sort of the communication between the game and the render thread as well. Uh, so w one of the big things we've done is in previous versions we've had parallel anime evaluation. So if we're actually trying to compute the poses uh, from an anime blueprint. But now in 4.11, it, I think it's optional and in 4.12 it's on by default. I just don't remember what we shipped to the default state of it. Um, you can parallelize the update as well. And so, you know, typically it, it depends on exactly how many bones you have and how complex your anim graph is, but frequently you end up with almost a 50-50 split between update and eval. And so, you know, we were doing half the work on another thread, but the other half was still on the main thread. And now that other half can move on to the other thread as well. Um, it's pretty much fully automatic, uh, like when it's enabled. It, you know, it just automatically does the um, update on the other thread. But there's actually three different phases to animation, so there's still a portion that is sort of game, under game control that may or may not be parallelizable, depending on how you do it. Um, for example, in Anim Blueprint, you have sort of the uh, tick function, where you write some code to pull properties from your pawn or your player controller or whatever to drive your animation. Like, you know, what is the velocity? Am I, you know running, am I walking, am I jumping, you know, pulling all of that state, that still has to happen on the game thread because it's reading game state. Whereas sort of once we've internalized that data into the anim instance, then the rest of the anim graph update can happen on another thread. But that initial chunk, like you need to time and see how much time am I spending in this. Um, we've had support for writing some portion of that in C++ for a long time. But we've increased the amount that you can do in C++, uh, both last UDC for the kite demo, but then uh, quite a bit more uh, in 4.11 and 4.12 as well. So in addition to uh, state machine transition rules, uh, we've actually added a fast path to read uh, properties in the anim graph, so we no longer have to go back into the Blueprint VM to get those things. So if you wire in like a, actually let me just open up the anim Blueprint here. So this is what I was talking about, this is your tick. Mm -hmm. So this part is still going to be running on the game thread. Um, and so you want this to be as optimal as possible if you have a lot of them. Like, you know, for your main hero, you don't have to worry about it quite so much because there's probably only going to be one of them. But if you have, you know, uh, a bunch of minions, like you have a hundred or a thousand little things that could be spawning and running around, that's where you probably want to, hey, let me write this in C++ and get it as optimal as possible because I'm going to run so many copies of it. Um, but over here, oops. Um, in the M graph, this one's fairly simple. It's just got a single state machine in the states. Um, this right here used to have to, like whenever we evaluated this node during update, we actually had to call back into the anim blueprint of uh, the virtual machine and say, hey, you know, basically this turns into a variable set where it would read speed and then write it to um, something inside of this node. Um, this now just automatically happens. Like it, it's um, like a bit of code during the evaluation will just automatically grab this property. Hmm. And it works for any direct variable writes. And I think it also works uh, if you do a Boolean not. So if you have a bool on like a state transition rule, so if we go back out here, inside of one of these transition rules, mm -hmm. is an error. You could also have is not, is an error not, and then into the candidate transform, and it'd be able to optimize that path as well. Um, 
We haven't done it yet, but I think we're actually going to end up adding like on a tooltip or something, showing you whether it hit the fast path or not. So you can, you know, at a glance see, you know, oh, this transition rule, I might want to try and reword it or compute the not value, you know, compute the more complicated value over in the tick so that then in the graph it can uh, avoid using the VM at all. And so again, this is something that just automatically happens. You don't have to opt into it, it just goes faster. Wow. So. Yeah. Um, another change we made, which I'm pretty sure is not in 4.11, it's coming in 4.12, is um, automatically baking out additive uh, animations. So it used to be we'd have to decompress uh, the base animation and decompress the additive, do the math, and then um, potentially change uh, space spaces on it again, like change uh, what uh, space it was computed in. And so all of that can be really expensive. Um, so now during Cook, um, I think we may actually be changing it so it, you get the benefit in the editor as well. Um, we go ahead and bake that down so that the additive is just like a single animation that has to be decompressed instead of uh, two that have to be decompressed and blended. Um, and I think that's something like a, a 3x win for additive animations. Um, another thing we've done is, and we've done this across the whole engine, um, but animation in particular was a major pain point that we've gone through and uh, tidied up, is getting rid of uh, both memory churn and uh, heap allocations wherever possible. So uh, a lot of different aspects of the animation evaluation pipeline have changed to use the stack allocator, which is basically just a, if you know that the memory is gonna be produced and consumed on one thread in one frame, you can use the stack-based allocators, which basically just, allocation is as simple as just incrementing a number, like, you know, I'm giving out memory in a stack, and then I clear it all back down to a mark. Um, and so you can use that for game code too, as long as you know that those preconditions are set. So for example, almost everything allocated on the render thread uses the stack-based allocator as well for frame to frame, within a frame allocations, not for things that have to persist across multiple frames. Mm -hmm. And that was probably another 2x win on evaluation. So, so it's, it's probably three times faster. Yeah. Wow. And it significantly reduced uh, overall memory churn. Like if you're actually using memory profiler, mm -hmm. um, the, the amount of like per frame churn allocations is dramatically reduced. Oh, cool. Um, and also we just got rid of a lot of things that shouldn't have been allocations in the first place, like uh, doing pre-sizing and stuff like that. Avoiding growth during, you know, just uh, catching wild low hanging fruit. Okay. And that was, you know, it was just across the whole engine. We just went through and, you know, let me look for short lived, like one frame allocations and just fix as many of them as you can. Oh, that's really nice then. So it's just overall yep. just better. Mm -hmm. I like that. You don't have to do anything. Yep. And that also helps uh, on multi threaded machines with reducing uh, lock contention on your allocator if you're not using uh, something like TBD that has heaps per flow. So, talked about a lot of the scalability tools. Mm -hmm. um, um, one thing, the, yeah. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we didn't cover into too much depth, but I guess actually we did talk about the scalability IMA. So we talked about yeah. scalability. We didn't really talk about yeah. the 3D render scale in particular. But, but oh, that yeah. one's really cool. I just want to cover that. Uh, so, one of the sort of like the probably the single biggest hammer you have in terms of scalability is what your 3D render scale is if you're GPU bound. Um, the way the engine's set up is you can set like an overall resolution. I know like in window full screen, it will just be the resolution of your desktop. And in full screen mode, it's whatever you've chosen. And all of the HUD will be rendered at that resolution. But all of the 3D stuff, so all the really heavy duty things, get rendered at whatever your 3D render scale is. And it's just a value between zero and one but typically you'll probably limit it to between 50% and one. And that was actually hard coded in the engine um, in previous versions, but in 4.12, you'll be able to adjust it sort of over a more generous range. Um, and so what it does is like, you know, we just render the whole 3D scene at say 86% or you know 50% or 70% or whatever, and then we upscale it back at the end. <laughs> and then there's a line. There's a line. But there was a line. Well, <laughs> <laughs> just a little one. Um, a little line. So there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, for example, when you did scalability auto in previous versions of the engine, it would just automatically pick like 100% or 86% or 77% or I think 66%. Yeah, something like that. That's not really ideal though. Yeah, like, because what? it depends so much on what your the actual native monitor resolution was. And so what we do now in, I think this is not 411, I think it's 412. I think 
is we instead look at your actual screen resolution and we look at what your target scalability setting is based on the GPU benchmark and then we compute the value based on that to end up with an effective 3D resolution. And so I think the defaults in the engine, which uh, you'll be able to change by 412, is 1440 for epic settings, um, 12, or 1080. 1080 for high... 900. Oh yeah, 900, yeah, 900 for medium. And then uh, 720 for low. And so what'll happen is, say you've got a 1440 monitor, but you've got a really weak GPU, we'll compute that you should run at 720 instead of 1440 and then upscaled. Yeah, and okay. you'll still be free to, to go and move yeah. the slider yourself if you really want to, but it's just, it's just a, a much better default. It, yeah, just a better default. Because right? mm -hmm. yeah. people often, seem often to have really <laughs> nice monitors and then really bad GPUs. Like, kind of older GPUs. Or... Well, it's also really common with modern laptops. Like they, yes. they almost all have like high a high DPI monitor, it seems, but then they might have like a low-end uh, integrated GPU or a low-end like mobile Optimus or low-end integrated. And so that helps quite a bit there as well. We also use the screen resolution during texture streaming as well, where on all settings below Epic, we set basically a maximum effective screen resolution because texture streaming you know, actually computes like what MIP level I need to use based on screen resolution, field of view, and so on and so forth, because it's computing sort of like, you know, what MIP would I want to sample if I could ideally? But that used to be sort of unbounded. So if you had a really high resolution monitor, but not a lot of texture memory, we compute that we wanted a really high MIP, we'd end up in an overcommitted situation and the streamer can't work very well in that state. Mm -hmm. So now we say in the same way, I think we actually use basically the same resolutions. Here's the maximum effect resolution. Even if you set it higher, we compute it as if you were on this monitor so that we avoid uh, overcommitting. Mm -hmm. But instead of using performance to set that threshold, we use uh, amount of VRAM so that, um, or strictly speaking, texture quality scalability setting. The goal of being just to not attempt to use more memory than your graphics card actually has, which yep. is bad news for us. <laughs> yeah, and there's also uh, some improvements coming in 412 for when you are overcommitted mm -hmm. to not do really dumb things like drop all the MIPS, and just drop a few of the MIPS. Uh, many many just a lot improvements. Of bug fixes many to improvements to texture streaming will be coming this year. Hopefully, yep. but that's not performance. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, some other time, probably. It's kind of performance. Yeah. It's tied in with scalability I mean, it, it, and everything it, it, else. It ties in with scalability. All right, all right. Then start fighting, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, another area, kind of closely related to animation, that got a lot of love is uh, Apex cloth simulation. Mm -hmm. um, so we fixed a lot of bugs with cloth. And we've made it many times faster. I don't know the exact number. It depends on your assets, like how many verts in each island of cloth and how many different sections of cloth you have. But, uh, you know, they were huge wins, like, you know, probably 4x or more uh, speed up on the individual bits of cloth. And then also for purely cosmetic cloth, when you're not actually having it affect other items in a physics simulation, you, uh, it can run entirely in parallel and not have to block or be blocked by the physics simulation. So that allows it to sort of run somewhere in the frame uh, where there's a gap. You know, we just run it at a lower priority, or actually at a higher priority, rather. Um, and so that allows cloth to, in some cases, be basically free. Like, it's not on your critical path, and so, you know, it, it's not impacting you very much. Um, yeah, and this is, yeah. This is also, uh, this isn't the same as we had showed Anim Dynamics, which is another great kind of, uh, feature for improving your, uh, your, your kind of overall how much you're using while kind of doing sort of clothy things. This is the proper Apex one. That one doesn't actually use Apex because yeah. we get a lot of questions about that one. Right, but the, the Epic cloth is still actually being done on the CPU. It doesn't use the mm -hmm. GPU, so it runs equally well on NVIDIA or AMD or consoles or whatever. That's right. Um, one other thing about it is we split it up so that each individual piece of cloth runs its own separate task is that allows you to be more granular both in, say I want to have cloth only at certain lods and not cloth at other lods, as well as saying things like, let me get the time it takes for you know, each individual character instead of only being able to get like a granular number of, or a course number of how much time did cloth take for the whole frame. And anodynamics in the same way allow you to do lot at individual character level, whereas if you're using um, ragdolls or physics simulations, you wouldn't 
have like control or knowledge over that. Like you just sort of submit it to the physics scene, and the physics scene is like this monolithic task that it's hard to dive in and get more details on. So both of those give you a lot of control yeah. on a per character basis. Yeah. Um, then probably the last uh, big area we want to talk about is uh, Slate and UMG. So it, here, in sort of in addition to like a lot of these other systems, we've done a lot of just below, below the under the covers, um, fine grained optimizations, just fixing lots of little issues, um, making things more efficient, both memory and performance. Um, you know, reducing allocations. Um, also fixed quite a few bugs. So just in terms of stability, like uh, UMG especially is just a lot, lot more rock solid in four eleven and four twelve. Um, but there's two major sort of new features that allow you to opt in to faster code where you have to actually do something yourself and satisfy certain preconditions that allows you to build much more efficient uh, things like HUDs. Like you wouldn't really need to use this on a front end. You'd probably only use it for the HUD where you know you want to, the vast majority of your performance going to your 3D scene. Hmm. Um, so one of these is called the validation panel. Uh, actually, validation box rather. Let me just make a widget blueprint real quick. Oops. <laughs> yeah, that was the entire doc you actually wrote. Up. No. I don't <laughs> know. We don't need, we don't yeah, it's okay. We're pretty close. That was to actually, yeah, I have the Q&A all over here, so all right, cool. this stuff. Uh, so when we get to that part. <laughs> <laughs> when we do it live every now and then. <laughs> Something yeah. happened. The fundamental idea behind a validation panel is Slate recomputes the um, the layout for everything. Every frame um, in, well, a, in a game HUD, yeah. you don't necessarily want to, to pay the cost for doing that. Although it's quite nice when you're actually have a dynamic, uh, you know, slate application that that happens. Yes, yeah. if you're building like a complicated, uh, you know, front end scene where like you've got dynamic lists that grow and shrink and stuff like that, a lot of that's doing useful work every frame, and it may be changing every frame. Exactly. But in a HUD, you've got a fairly fixed layout, like this is always going to be in this corner, this is always going to be this corner, and so on and so forth. And so the invalidation panel lets you say, I know that the geometry of this is not going to change unless I told it to. So for example, set player name may change the length of you know the name in the top right corner of the screen. So you'd invalidate it saying, I'm changing this now. But then for the rest of the time, the rest of the frames, what it does is it uh, caches off the, the vertex and index buffers, and it'll keep rendering those every frame. And so that means you can do things, you can still do animation with this um, using materials. So if you put in a material and you have like a time-based thing, or you uh, create a material instance dynamic and say, like a health bar, you can set current value, maximum value, and have like a nice, you know, like it lurps to the, the value as you get healed or damaged and stuff like that. You can still do all of that, have it render every frame, but pay basically no CPU cost for it because none of the slate uh, uh, layout processing happens. Um, but there are caveats, like you don't want to just always use this because things like hitbox testing and that kind of stuff don't work with it or don't always work with it. So typically you're going to use this, again, only for your HUD for sort of things that are not mouse interactive. Um, it's a specific optimization for a very specific case where you, you know yeah. exactly what's going to happen. But the gains can be uh, really high. Um, and so invalidation panels still end up rendering every frame. Like, you know, they take that geometry and resubmit it. Um, but it also means that if something is changing every frame and you're invalidating it, you actually end up paying more costs. So you don't want to put an invalidation panel around literally everything. Like, look at it and think about, should this, like, what is the volatility? Is it... Infrequently changing, never changing, or always changing, basically. Um, so one other thing I can show is, for anybody who doesn't know about it, is the widget reflector. Control R, but apparently not. Um, so you can use the console to open it up. It's just uh, widget reflector is the command. But then also it's under developer tools, uh, widget reflector. I'm going to throw this out here because we've used the widget reflector on another stream and it caused some funkiness on the stream. <laughs> so just to throw that out there, if you see some funkiness, it might just be yeah. the stream itself, guys. I apologize for that. It's kind of funky. funky. But the, the widget reflector is like in the same way the stat system is your go-to for you know game thread and render thread. The widget reflector should be your go-to for Slate and UMG. Like it just allows you to inspect a hierarchy of anything in the scene. 
but also uh, while this is up, you can actually turn it on to invalidation debugging. And there's nothing in the scene that is using invalidation panels right now, because like I was saying, it's primarily just for non-interactive game HUD. But it allow it'll actually draw different colored outlines around the different widgets based on uh, when they're being invalidated. And so this can be really useful to catch things like, hey, I'm invalidating this every frame. I shouldn't be using an invalidation panel around it, or I should set it to uh, volatility to volatile. Um, so this is just a, if you're using this, absolutely use this to inspect your scene and make sure you're doing what you intended to be doing. The other um, major new feature is the retainer panel, uh, or retainer box. And so it's kind of in the same way as the invalidation panel, if you know that you fit the right criteria for it, it can be a really huge win. It even avoids doing the rendering every frame. What it actually does is it renders to a texture every in frames. So you say, you know, say you're doing a 60 hertz game or a 95 hertz VR game, um, you can say, I actually only want to render this once every three frames or once every four frames because the data is like slow to change or slow to update. Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to get a new kill every frame. You might get a new kill every couple seconds. And so if there's like, you know, a quarter of a second or an eighth of a second before your kill counter updates, before you see it, it doesn't really matter. Um, in this one, materials won't even be rendering every frame because it's, it's just caching it off once to a texture. So... You know, you're not going to use it everywhere, but it can be really useful where you just have to get that time down. Um, and you, because each individual panel has its own sort of tick rate, you can set um, you know, different aspects of your HUD to different things. Like this one should update once every other frame. This one should update once every three frames. You know, this stuff over here has to update every single frame. You know, it, basically the control's left up to you. Yeah, and you want to be careful when you set those up so that if you're doing them over the course of... Every three frames, you don't make everything go on yeah. every three frames. There's a, right? there's a but, phase offset, basically, where you can say, you know, this should happen on, you know, start here or start here, so that way. Yeah, you don't want nothing, 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 everything. You want you want something, 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 something. Yeah. So you can even frame it. Now, uh, Nick Darnell's in the in the chat. And he's telling, telling us why we said something wrong, I'm sure. Well, no, he's telling me <laughs> to remind you to mention the is volatile flag if you haven't already. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know. And uh, yeah. also, thank you, Nick, for being in there and talking to people and stuff. Clearly, I need to get you on one of these streams because you're dropping knowledge bombs left and right. Yeah, you know, it's been a while, I think. Yeah, I think it'd be a good idea to have another UMG stream. There's a lot of good stuff yeah. that's happened over the past couple versions. Oh yeah. So, like, you know, here's on the retainer box. Cool. And then the validation panel. I can type. <laughs> Sorry, Nick Darnell said no. I can't have him. <laughs> can't oh, get you. I'll get you on one of these. So yeah, uh, you can set it vol is volatile, and you know there's good tooltips on all this stuff as well. I'm sure you can't read that, but it's explaining what the volatility is doing and when you would use it, basically. Um, yeah, uh, one of the last things I want to talk about is like we've also done a lot of game specific optimizations mm -hmm. to you know get the Paragon HUD running in as little time as possible, um, and these kind of techniques will be useful. You know, to anybody else trying to get like high performance HUD on mobile or stuff like that. Um, one of the biggest things, and this is true across everything, is avoiding ticks in blueprints. And in the HUD case, this actually includes uh, bound properties. Like if you're actually calling a function or you know reading another blueprint variable every frame uh, via blueprint code, then that time, you know, while it's minuscule for a single thing, it can really add up when you have tens or hundreds of different widgets doing this, plus hundreds of actors in the scene, and so on and so forth. Um, and so what we do is we marshal the data to drive the HUD in C++, and then we push it back into Blueprints, or we push it back into the individual widgets and invalidate them as we do it. You know, so this sort of works in conjunction with invalidation panels and stuff. So in the case of like the kill count I mentioned before, um, you would only update that widget when the number of kills changed, as opposed to every frame polling for how many kills happened. And that's especially true for things that are expensive to compute. Um, for example, like which heroes are alive or dead, you, if you're not keeping track of sort of the state transitions, you'd have to you know, go find all 10 actors, poke their memory and say, hey, are you alive or are you dead? And you know, that time, again, that one example may not be expensive, but it all adds up overall. Um, that doesn't mean we don't use blueprints. Like, we still use blueprints for massive amounts of stuff. We just avoid using it for things that happen every frame. Mm -hmm. So, 
for example, like when we start, you know, like a character is dead and we show them on screen, that that logic is primarily done in blueprints, but the transition, the logic for figuring out when it should happen is all done in C++. So we still do as much as we can in the blueprints, you know, just because of ease of iteration and uh, visualization and everything else. Do you do you have like a rough idea of what the percentage of code would be for the blueprint? Uh, basically, because you know, I know they're going to ask when you start mentioning those two things. Yeah, we usually start with like build it out in blueprints and then move the bits of, that are slow to C++. And that's and and I think only that's move the stuff do, yeah. that actually shows up in a profile, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's the smart way to go about doing it is, is the rapid prototyping through blueprints, solidify it in code. Yeah, and the uh, stat system helps a lot here. Mm -hmm. um, every time we do a transition between the VM and C++, uh, we actually put a U object uh, scope stat. Uh, and you can add this into your own code too. Uh, we also use it for animation and so on and so forth. So in the stat call stack, it, you'll see like two stats paired. You'll see, you know, uh, call function, and then you'll see the actual U function name. So you'll see like, you know, widget blueprint, uh, you know, set dump kills or whatever. And that'll actually show up in the stat call stack. So if you use stat dump pitches or stat dump frame or stat start file, um, you can see, you know, where this time is going. Um, oh, uh, that actually reminds me of one other thing. The, when you're looking at like the high level stats, so if you do like stat space slate, you may see like a lot of time spent quote unquote in slate. And it may not be Slate's fault. It may be largely game code. So, because that includes all of the time for like widget ticks and widget updates and stuff, all gets aggregated into that one stat. But then if you do a stat dump frame, you may see that like the Slate overhead was microseconds and then it called into game code that took milliseconds. And so, yeah. Don't knee jerk react when you see something being slow. It may be your own fault. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. Nick might come for you. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, Want to go to questions? Yeah, let's, let's, let's set up some Q and A here. Let's do it now. Um, now I'm not sure. Uh, actually, leave this open. It might help you if you click on um, my face again. If you can get back in there. Okay. Can you go ahead and just pass one. Yeah, you know that, that way. That way, you guys can take a look at them first and uh, get an idea of which ones are better than others. We we do get a lot of questions that are close, but not quite what you might be able to answer. So. I don't want to waste your time with things that are just going to be like a, oh, oh. Okay, there we go. There's the notes again. As they load. All right. And we got quite a few questions. Uh, two. There we go. Yeah, so a lot of questions out of here. Um, so the top one is about light mass portals. I wasn't sure if maybe you could. Um, I do not know what's going on with light mass right. portals. I don't know. All we right. could, uh, if you post on the forums, maybe we can get Daniel to respond. Yeah, uh, yeah, actually, that's a that's another good point. If you had a question here and we're not able to get to it, the forum post is a great place to go and ask your questions because it's often where uh, our developers and people go immediately afterwards just to see what had happened and, and mm -hmm. what you're asking about. Um, let's see. Um, let's see here. Uh, you guys think that one? No. Uh, honestly, if, so the question is, mm -hmm. will there be an easy way to filter out the UDP message overhead when you're using the session front end to connect remotely and do a capture? Honestly, I basically never use that. I always use stat start file and stat stop file for capture. Okay. Yeah. You just have it on your local device. And... Yeah. Because frequently what I'll end up doing is I'll capture a bunch of times and then I'll analyze. Like I'm not doing it quite live. Like okay, let me run around with nobody else in the level, let me run around with bots in the level, let me run around in full match, and capture several different profiles, and then be looking at those offline. Or even sometimes having uh, somebody else capture them, like QA might cap do captures or whatever. So from that point of view, you know, I just seldom use like the, the online uh, stat capture. If I'm online and trying to look at, like, why is it slow right now, I'm usually either using on the on-screen stat commands, or I'm using uh, stat dump frame or stat dump hitches. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, there was a question about the, uh, this one's actually about the significance manager, was uh, because you're talking about how there's just so many kinds of uh, things to test, was there a way to uh, set up profiles of them? It was a little bit, uh, the uh, question was a little bit, yeah, I don't know if that's specifically significance manager. I mean, with a significance manager, you would... You're usually changing it frame to frame, mm -hmm. and you're probably not going to do the overhead of calling, you know, setting an individual C bar. No, but, I mean, you could implement your own functions, like how to react 
to certain out of mm. out of budget frames, and then and then your one function you could you could move as many C bars as you wanted in that one place. Yeah. Uh, you if you're looking for something that I find somewhat useful is if you're looking to like say you have a, an operation that you do commonly just for your own testing, where you're like, mm -hmm. well, what I usually do is go into the game and I change these eight C bars to this or that or other to, to, to test whatever. Uh, in C++ code, you can set up a, it's like a class for F auto console variable function or something. So you can, basically you can make your own C bar that binds to a C++ function. And in that function, yeah. then you can toggle as many as you want. So you can basically, that's kind of like a profile that you can set up yourself yeah. in code. Well, I think there's also a, um, uh, in default input, you can define like a, debug commands that you can execute multiple C bars in there as well. I believe. Um, so there's some systems like that for like, I commonly run these three commands when I'm profiling. Okay. Um, for okay. the, the actual significance manager, if you mean like I want to do multiple things based on a significance value, um, you can basically set up um, different tags in the significance manager and say, this function is associated with the tag in terms of how do I compute the significance value, which ultimately just ends up being a float. And then you can say, all right, let me get all of the objects that are registered with the significance manager for my tag. So let me say, let me get all the objects that are heroes, and then I run through their uh, significance values and do something based on that. And so like that's how we do things like the log budgets is, you know, we have a tag for heroes. So when a hero is created or destroyed, it registers with the significance manager, and then he's being computed every frame. And then after that computation's done, we say, all right, for all heroes with, for all, Objects registered with the Seams Manager with the hero tag. Let me do this one function that you know just quickly goes and sets the log values if they've changed. Oh, okay. Uh, so I was corrected that it was uh, it, uh, that actually answered some some other questions. Uh, come mm -hmm. to think of it, so I've knocked them out. But um, the one about C bars, uh, I had merged two questions on accident. My bad. Um, it was actually he wants to know it was that, and then um, if there was a way to batch your uh, C bar changes. So what? What, uh, these are from Michael Aller, and he's saying that what he's doing is he goes into Blueprint and he sets like a bunch of uh, nodes for the uh, command and just says trigger that when he wants to kind of hot switch them, but he doesn't have a good way of just saying like at once change well, to this profile versus that profile. So depending on are you, if you're doing this like all the time, I'm not so sure, but if you're doing mm -hmm. this like you pick a scalability setting for the game, like am I on low, medium, or high settings, there's in the base scalability and default scalability, uh, everything is like a set of buckets of C bars. And so there's some code in there that does that. So you could either use the scalability buckets themselves, like so, you know, view distance and it's at symbol zero, view distance at symbol one, two, and three. Or you can find the code in the scalability CPP that actually is reading those. And so there's already some code in the engine that does that. I just don't know if it's exposed publicly or not. And if you end up having to add like engine API on that, just do a pull request and you'll get that into the engine. Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, that's true too, of course, because the, the source is all there. So if you mm -hmm. go through and make it, we'll take it. Yep. That's awesome. But yeah. That there's definitely code in there that like does a bucket. Like, let me look for a section named this, mm -hmm. and I'm going to apply <clears throat> every C bar in that section to the the C bars. Okay. Cool. Oh, one other thing. Um, mm -hmm. I forgot to mention this earlier, but one of the other things coming in 4.11 is we made it so that you can use blueprints to do uh, game user settings. So you can do stuff like the scalability stuff. You could do that in the past using uh, console execs. So you could do like scalability zero or scalability one or two or three or scalability auto to run the benchmarker. But we've actually explicitly exposed those. So now you could like make a UMG widget blueprint that is like your UI for a setting screen and do that all in blueprints without having to write any C++. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really cool. Huh. Um, all right. Uh... Does the spline thing in 4.12 mean you don't need a scene component for each, uh, uh, mean you don't need a new scene component for each part of the spline? No, that's, doesn't really have anything to do with the, the, uh, side. the like with the setup, game side, yeah. like with the way that you create the things. It's more like, previously if you took the one spline component that you had, and you just like, you know, copy pasted it into multiple places in your scene, that would end up making different draw policies. Uh, whereas if you do that now, it'll be merged into a single draw policy, just kind of behind the scenes. It doesn't really affect any user-facing um, stuff there. And then what, instant static mesh components, using the same static mesh and different actors, are they merged? Uh, 
No, actually, and for good reason. So if, if you have two instant static mesh components, um, the reason you might do that is because you might want them to LOD at different rates, because within one single instant static mesh component, uh, if the LOD changes, the LOD for all the instance changes at once, because that's what instancing is. Instancing is, hey, I'm going to draw all these m meshes exactly the with same. one draw call exactly the same. So you, you wouldn't necessarily want to put like literally every instance of of some tree into a single instance mesh component because then they would all LOD yeah. well, at the same rate. Also you, for you calling, want to break, like, break it up because like if, you know, calling, entire yeah. section of things are behind a mountain. You know, call, you can call that whole thing at once. Whereas if you had every single one in the level, one of them is always going to be visible. So and you know the balance for the whole thing will be the entire yeah. level basically. So, so basically, each instance static mesh component is an island in and of itself. It'll, it'll be one draw call and it won't merge across across actors. Um. Uh, there was a kind of longer question up there, and, and think about that one if you can. But uh, the the bottom one there, Michael, I think uh, that one popped up while you're talking yeah. about the new uh, anim uh, stuff that came in. Uh, uh, so I don't actually know. I actually uh, emailed Tom before so, this to ask. Oh, sorry, I have to say sorry, I have to say it out loud. Yes. So, the, the question is plans to add greater than or compares to yeah. the fast paths anim. So yeah. So in. like the fast paths where like it tries mm -hmm. to grab a variable and then reads it. Like, I know knots are supported. I don't actually know if we have greater than or less than, but yes. uh, I think it's definitely something we've considered. So I'll find the answer to that and post it back on the forum. Okay, cool. So yeah, uh, throw that one into the forum post and we can get back to you on that one. Cool. Cool. Yeah, for the session one, yeah. I don't think I know. Yeah, if you guys don't know on that one, then I guess that one can be... No, I don't know. Good. All right. Well, I guess that'll be it for for now. We had a couple of other ones that were just a, a bit out of their area, guys. I, I just already know that they're going to be. Um, and uh, questions about documentation or not. But uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, and uh, know that on Tuesday is going to be Zach Parrish in these chairs again showing Blueprint Comms. So now Zach has to lay across multiple yeah, oh, chairs. Oh, he has to. Yeah, he has to do like the full like sprawl and all that. It would be great. Uh, you know, and so uh, be sure to come tune in Tuesday, two o'clock training stream, and it's Blueprint Communications, uh, and then we'll be switching back and forth, of course, with all the new stuff. I'm actually really uh, happy about this because it's new training content that we've been kind of planning for a while, and it's all starting to come in. So that would be exciting. Come out, check it out, say hi to Zach. You know, I'll be in the chat, and um, and thank you guys both so much for. Coming out, I actually threw this up in kind of short notice, and they've been super cool about everything. So I really, I, I owe you both big time. No it's been really cool. We got to see a lot of uh, fancy new features, and uh, yeah, just had a really great time. Yeah, and there, there's actually a lot more coming in 411 and 412 than what we hit here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just you know had to pick and choose to keep it to a reasonable amount of time. So it's yeah. gonna be pretty great releases. Yeah, yeah, actually, actually that bullet list was starting to get pretty big. <laughs> yeah, I think if you if you just look at the 411 release notes when they come out, oh yeah. See, yeah. It's going to be it's massive. Quite large. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, thank you all for coming out. Uh, Tuesday is Zach. Thursday is going to be Game Jam stuff. So see you next week. Cool. Thanks a lot. Have a great time.